Bet, 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 bet. What's going on, big bro? How you doing? Thanks for tapping in. Man, bro, thank you for tapping in, man. You know what I'm saying? I appreciate it, man. I, like I said, bro, I'm a big fan of the work, man. Big fan of the work, bro. Well, you know, when the guy finds the calls, I got to answer. Man, I appreciate it. Appreciate it. Um, So, man, let's get it started, man. Hey, this is a special edition, man. Street Certified Podcast. It's your boy, Mrex El Guapo, man. And we have, hold on, let me get this. Let me get this straight. I got it. We got Mr. Al Prophet, man, straight out of Detroit, Michigan, has written and directed numerous films, including the Frank Matthews story, Killing Jimmy Hoffa, Motown Mafia. His YouTube channel is the number one brand for full-length gangster documentaries and commentary on crime, history, and politics. Man, Mr. Al Prophet, man, how's it going? Pretty good. How about you? Man, I'm doing pretty good, man. So how we usually get it started is, man, I'll just ask, ask the guest, man. First and foremost, who is Al Prophet? Well, it's hard to give a Cliff's Notes version of my life. But uh, so from Detroit, from the middle of Detroit, um, like most people from those type of environments, had some misunderstandings with the law, young. Then I went on to get a master's degree in economics. And um, as I was getting, well, I got a bachelor's and then, but. I couldn't get it in economics from Michigan, a global top 30 learning institution, but I couldn't get any employment in the corporate sector. So then I I uh, had a misunderstanding with some what's now medicinal or no. Uh, in Arizona, it's what? It's uh, recreation. I bought okay. pounds of weed and marijuana and do a year there. And I came back. I was like, well. Either I'm going to keep doing this type of stuff or I'll go back to school. So I went and got uh, my master's degree, but I always wanted to make Hey, Al, we can't we can't really hear you, Al. It's, it's hear a me little now? muffled. Yeah, it's a little hear muffled. Me? Hear me now? Yeah. Okay. So I went back and got my master's degree. While I was doing that, I um, got into shooting music videos in Detroit. And that was like 06 to 08, 09 when the kind of like you know the genre of low-cost street rap videos that are popular i'm not gonna say i invented that but i was one of the people in the beginning that was doing that so i did probably 100 music videos in detroit uh by myself and then i was ready to do a documentary so i did something called murder city which is about crime in detroit america's most violent city and I kind of did it as practice because I knew I didn't quite know what I was doing. But then I finished and I was like, oh, shit, this came out good. Let me go ahead and release it. And it became kind of a big phenomenon. Now, unfortunately, that was when it was still DVDs, but they were being bootlegged. But there was not the the digital, the video on demand hadn't, you know, there was like YouTube right. had been started. You couldn't monetize, blah, blah, blah. So I had a lot of notoriety, but the income didn't match. But then finally, uh, you know, technology caught up with what I was doing and between like documentaries and YouTube and Amazon Prime and et cetera, you know, things kicked in and I moved out to California in 2016. Okay, dope. So, hey, so growing up in Detroit, like you said, uh, you went to school uh, for economics. What made you get into like filmmaking and like more specifically like street filmmaking? So I always wanted to... to to make movies but you know going to college for movies just seemed kind of ridiculous it's like going to college to learn how to be a musician or something like you right. can learn technical skills but if you're smart you can teach the technical skills to yourself so i figured i'll get a real degree and i'll get paid to go to film school which is what the whole shooting the rap videos thing started as like well, i'm gonna have these guys pay me their little couple hundred dollars so while I'm learning to use the camera, but then that took on a life of its own. And then when I was, you know, wanted to finally make a movie that was like 08 and there wasn't like cheap, nice cameras where you could go make a decent movie for $20,000. It was still expensive. So I said, well, I got to make a documentary. Well, what am I going to make a documentary about? Well, I'm in Detroit and I have a lot of ties to, you know, people that were known street people, et cetera. So I said, I'll do a documentary about that. And then it, it was successful like any of our paths in life you know you do something whatever kind of is successful you keep going down that path right more and more people 
farther up the food chain or reach out to you and say, hey, we like what you did. Come do this with us. And then it takes out a life of its own. Right. Okay. So what was like your favorite gangster to research um, up to this point? And like, what was like one of the craziest stories that maybe you heard like doing your research where like it wasn't already popularly known? I, I know a lot of disturbing things. <laughs> <laughs> I, know, I mean, seriously, like it's, it's, you know, you get a, I want to learn about crime stuff. Like at a high level gives you kind of a, dark understanding of like just life like the powerful people i mean like you know people really give briefcases of money to judges who like cover up murders of children like all type of horrible things it is wild yeah um i would say you know like the when we started to do frank matthews it was kind of a question as to whether he was like even real like right. was he like a like uh, the black gangster boogeyman that people just like talked about to like, you know, have a story. We didn't know like, is this stuff really real? Cause it didn't sound believable. But Ron Chepsik, who I did it with it, you know, had a lot of federal Asian contacts and they were like, oh no, we had this investigation and et cetera. And then street people, that was, but like the Jimmy Hoffa one, well, and, and Cold War heroin heat, which are, it take place, you know, more back in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. It's tied in with a lot of political stuff. And, you know, some of it's exciting. Some could be a little dry to some people. But, well, you know, it's involving politics at the highest levels. And it's not any type of conspiracy theory stuff. It's all very, you know, I, I, I tend to just kind of use, like, articles, New York Times, stuff from Congress, things that are accepted. But because they're scattered around in time and no one looks at it all at once, it just seems like, oh, there was a bad governor over here and a shady CIA agent over here and this and that. But no, they weren't just random things. It's all it was all tied together. together. Yeah. So, hey, growing up in Detroit back I'll back you, then. I'll tell you a wild story. Okay. A wild story. This is one I can tell. And it's actually out of Chicago. So uh, uh, a guy who's... The younger male relative of a guy that was uh, a very prominent, well-known uh, black underworld figure in Chicago had a relative, another male relative, more recently in time, like the last 10 or so years, who um, doing stuff for the cartel. So okay. at the last, he had like, I think it was 50 kilos, and he decided he wanted to get out of the game. So, you know, run off on the plug, right? Don't pay for the last ones. So they come and they're looking for him and they find him. So they take him to the bank and to all his relatives and make him round up the money to pay. Okay, so that's normal, right? Right. But so he paid. They took him back home. They said, here's another 50 bricks you still work for us. Because <laughs> at that level, there's not very many people that can actually you can get, you know, millions of dollars worth of drugs to they can even sell it, right? right? I mean, despite what the rappers all yap about, like, I mean, you know, if someone showed up at your doorstep with, you know, 50 kilos of cocaine and say you owe us 1.2 million in three weeks, I mean, can you really, can you really get rid of it and get the money? There's not many, so they don't just let you go when you can do stuff like that, you know? Right, hey, that's funny, so they gave, so they gave him another pack, it was like, man, keep oh, working, yeah. man. Sure. Yeah, it doesn't stop because you're too valuable. Because the <laughs> people that were giving it to him, they have pressure from farther up the food chain. So right. the Mexicans that are in the U.S., well, they're getting, someone's giving them 500 keys every month that they got to get rid of. So now they got these guys who can dispose of it and psh, don't stop because it's too much money. <laughs> talking specifically about YBI, I mean, you can see BMF is like almost kind of an exact like a much larger scale version but kind of the same thing like friends and it what you know i don't know it just even like i was watching the jeezy gucci man versus thing and all that like yeah and what you think about that man what you think about what jeezy said man uh, i mean unless he were to it's easy to like say oh i moved on and i'm more mature and that's cool good 
but I, I I don't really follow it like that. But I never know knew of him to come out and say. Back when I was young and stupid and making money off of, uh, you know, talking about negativity, I got a guy named Pookie Lowe killed, and it was my fault. He didn't say that. He just wants to move on. But right. until he takes some blame, you know, yeah, he told him, you know, I killed your own boy. He ain't do nothing about it. So, so hey, who you think won? So who you think won? What do you mean by one what? I mean, Gucci Jeezy. <laughs> Jeezy's a much bigger artist. I mean, I don't. I like I like Gucci Man more, but that doesn't really. I mean, I'm not. Jeezy never really did it for me. Not that I dislike him. It just right. I I, I so like that. It's so the whole thing, the whole rap now has become so dark because you know, first it was back in the day, it was okay. I'm a creative person. I'm going to rap about what I see in my neighborhood. Then it became like when I was doing music videos, it was the drug dealers are going to put up the money for the kid in the neighborhood who can rap. And then, and this is when I stopped doing them. I, I, I was going to do a video for a guy, a kid, who I, he was about 19, but I had known him since he was like seven. And I felt bad because he probably saw like the first gun he saw was me and his older cousin in their house. So I was like, oh, I'll come do your free video. And all the kids on the block came outside and were like, oh, want us to bring the AK-47 out? And this was like maybe 08. And I was like, oh, this is what is about to happen. I foresaw it. And I said, I'm not participating. And I stopped doing videos. And so then now it's unless you've got a shot or shot somebody, like King Vi got signed because he beat a murder dude. Right, he beat the murder, and, right. And then if you're rapping about this stuff and there's never any violence around you, then you're just like Slim Jesus. It loses its excitement. So unless these guys are really involved in killing or getting killed, the fans aren't. So there's a um, financial reward now that the fans, you can't, you can't really blame it just on like, you know, the corporations. I mean, they're part of it too because YouTube and Apple allow this stuff to be sold. Yeah, monetize. I wonder that. Like, YouTube will let a rapper monetize a video with a gun in it, but, like, if I do a podcast yes. or if I yep. do something talking about guns, I won't be able to monetize my podcast. Yeah, I did a real good story about the Four Corner Hustlers um, Rico case that was going on in Chicago where they're trying to give the guys the death penalty, and <sighs> really interesting. It involves... Well, the story I did was was thinking about was there a connection between there was this rogue Chicago police unit that remember when it was a big scandal in Chicago. They, they out of this 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 police unit, these two white cops posed with this black teenager. They put deer antlers on them like they, yeah. they rode guns like they captured them. Well, that was Lamar Spann's little brother, Lamar Spann. Is the head guy in the in the four corners Rico case they're trying to give the death penalty to. So it made me think like if Lamar Spann and his crew were allegedly kicking doors, robbing people, killing people, and that Chicago police unit did that to his little brother was doing the same thing. Was that some like secret coded message from one set of robbers and killers to another? You know, right. so that's like a really interesting story, and I talked about police corruption and all that. But right, it can't get, you know, it can't get monetized. Then I got worried, was I going to get a community guideline strike? So I just made it private. Hey, let's go back to, uh, you know, what I mean, the '80s in Detroit, man. So I want to talk about White Boy Rick, man. Uh, that was a story that I, you know, I watch. Like I said, I watch everything, um, and it was like it was a riveting story, man. Um, so now you're talking about the movie or like what you No, 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 no. I'm talking I'm gonna get to the movie. I'm actually talking about the real, the real documentary, stuff. the real story uh, of White Boy Rick. Yeah, it's pretty. I mean, that's all. I mean, what's this, what's so riveting and disturbing about it, if you know the real story isn't even really him. It's the corruption around the Yeah, whole. and that's what I was going to say. Like was he even really considered a gangster back then or that was something that they made to kind of fix up the corruption because the story don't add, it don't add up you know what i mean uh well here's 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 here it is in a nutshell and this and my partner scott bernstein 
is the one that kind of like verified a lot of the unbelievable parts and, and found the FBI time sheets where they were paying him when he was 14. So Rick's father was a was a low level gun dealer in Detroit in the early 80s. And he was he was selling to the mob and to some black guys. And he was, of course, he's giving a little info to the FBI, too, on the side. He's playing all sides of the fence. And when the task force against the Curry brothers is formed, they're like, you know, I'm trying to figure out how to get to them. And they're like, well, we got an FBI informant in his neighborhood, Rick's father. So Rick's father basically sold his son to the task force, to the FBI and Detroit Police Joint Task Force. Like, I'll let you use my 14-year-old son, which is totally, to use someone under 18. Yeah, that's one. crazy. Yeah, it's totally ridiculous. Rick, the Currys were kind of on to him when he was about 15 or 16. They had another kid shoot him, but he lived, and he wakes up in the hospital, and the police are there, and they're like, well, just just act like you don't know why he shot you, and go back, and he won't think you're snitching. We'll arrange for the homeowner's insurance to pay you like $50,000. So Rick got his money. So Rick started off as like a plant in this drug ring, but then, you know, he's meeting the drug customers and the drug suppliers. So by the time the curries go away and they don't need Rick anymore, he has become a real drug. I mean, yeah, he was a real drug dealer. Like he was, he was getting stuff from one of Griselda Blanco's sons in Florida. Like his sister at one point got kidnapped by Griselda Blanco's son because Rick owed some money. Oh, all type of crazy stuff was going on. And some of the people Rick's father was selling guns to were some of the worst hitmen in Detroit. So he's was, you know, around them. So he's protected. So and I know about a week before he got locked up, um, Billy Joe Chambers, Chambers Brothers said Rick had given them some kilos on consignment for 15000 So if he was giving people stuff on consignment for 15000 I mean, he was getting them for what, 11 or 12? I mean, he was doing, he he was up there. So he was up really? there on the, on the, on the uh, food it's chain. A weird story. Yeah, that's a weird story. All right, so staying, kind of staying with that story. Um, In recent years, uh, former uh Harlem drug dealer and turned informant, uh, Apple Martinez, man, he been kind of out and about in the streets. <laughs> Seemingly trying to like regain, you know, that street legend glory. Um, a lot of people are, you know, rightfully calling him a rat, you know, saying that, you know, he deserves to die. People don't deserve to call him a street legend. Some other people are saying, hey, he was a street legend. He did things that other people didn't do. Like, how you feel about, you know, that whole um street legend turn rat, Alpo, white boy, Rick, these types of characters? Well, looking up to people because they, I mean, especially now, you know, in this last year, the age of Black Lives Matter, to consider somebody some type of hero or legend because they killed a bunch of black people. That's the problem, number one. Right. So he's a serial killer with some fun stories. So for people that aren't around murderers or never had anyone murdered or saw anyone murdered, they don't really get that. Like, he's a dangerous person. So that's why he's able to move around. Like, I mean, there's guys in Detroit, there's guys in Chicago, there's guys in any big city who are known informants and snitches and told on people and they're walking around. They right. might even still back selling dope and nobody does anything to them because, I mean, you better pack a lunch. Right. Like, someone who's killed, it's, it's cool to sit on the internet and talk about someone who's killed 17 people, but when they're walking down the street, now it's crunch time. Right. Would you would you make a movie about these guys? Like, would you kind of highlight these guys' story? Uh, I mean, I, Troy Reed and I were talking about using Alpo's footage. I mean, I don't know. I'm kind of, I'm kind of, I've done so much stuff. I'm being careful about. I'm not. Uh, you know, I'm not going to say never, but I'm not seeking that type of stuff out. Not really. I mean, the real issue is like, why are these, it's, it's a reflection of our society that these guys are even, like, why is the problem that he snitched? Isn't the problem that he killed a bunch of people? So like, you say, you're saying the problem should be that he killed a whole bunch of people, not yeah, that, that he snitched. a bad person right there. So what? Anything else? Well, I mean, I, I think I think what people are saying is that the people he killed weren't necessarily, you know, innocent women and children. Not to say that I don't know if he did or didn't, but I think 
all of the participants had kind of signed up for something. Early, we out of, how does anybody know how? So, so people know about a dead body in an alley in Washington, D.C. in 1989, what they signed up for. That's ridiculous. They don't. It's a bunch of people on the Internet who have regular jobs and want to feel, oh, I'm part of, I know about the streets, so I'm going to call someone to say And, you know, the whole thing is very, you know, I've been around a lot of real dangerous people and all type of different, both, like when I was in, like I've, I had some life, potential life cases. So I was in, I mean, those people are like dangerous, crazy people. Like, I mean, I know a guy who killed his brother for a piece of fried chicken. Damn. And like in real life, I mean, I met him in jail. Like he did that. Like in all sorts, of, I know people that have, I mean, I remember being a teenager, people were trying to get each other to rob each other's uncles and fathers and cousins and, killed her cousin like the whole thing is is you really been even around it slightly a little bit is it's so horrible that like talking about it like it's fun i guess it's enough in the past it's like us watching a cowboys and indians movie or the godfather it's so long ago and it's so disconnected from us it doesn't feel real but i mean i can remember it i know i'm still around i mean i still have friends who are very dangerous. I know what they do, and so I don't really have like a, you know, I know what it is and take it for what it is. So I know. hear you. I hear you. In all your times of filmmaking, um, what's been one of like your favorite stories that maybe like a lot of people don't even know about? Whether it's a political, um, you know, a gangster story, like just something that maybe you you were gonna do and you didn't do, but it's just it's never got out there. But it's something that you, it, it was really interesting to you. Oh, there's a lot of them, actually. Um, I don't know, I'll tell you a weird one. I was, was down in Detroit police homicide a few years ago. We've been working on this documentary about the Detroit rapper Blade Icewood. <clears throat> and there was all, you know, it's not going to come out. There's issues with people involved, et cetera. Okay. So we're down there. And the police, and we're about to go back and talk to the detective who did the case and talk about, you know, because the guy's been arrested, like it's all a joke. So they're running our names to see who we are, make sure before they take us back. And then that was a problem, so they came, they weren't going to let us go back, and they started trying to question us about other stuff, and this cop slid up next to the older cop, and he just said, I mean, it's like some, well, it is like some out of movie. He's like, you ever heard of the Black Bag Squad? And I said, yeah. I said, is that real? So the Black Bag Squad was this rumor thing that I guess was true that when in the 80s, Coleman Young was mayor, there was a special frequency on the Detroit police scanner. And only a few people could go on it. The mayor, the chief of police, a few other people. And there was a few police assigned to it. And they would get an ad, they would just get this ad, like an address. They would just go there and there might be broken glass and blood or something. And they were just supposed to clean it up, not investigate anything. So I always, it made my imagination run wild of like, was this like organized or they, or, you know, was it like the mayor doing so? Was he covering up for the auto industry executive killed a prostitute? Like, who knows? Like, right. It, this, but this was a cop, and he was like, yeah, it was real, and he told me a few things, he didn't want to go into too much, but he just wanted to let me know it was real, and I didn't approach him, he approached me. Wow, that, hey, that's crazy, and hey, that, hey, that remind me of, uh, remember Wolf on uh, Pulp Fiction and shit? Well, I, I, I know someone who's like that right now in real life, and I'm, I'm definitely not going to go into that, but <laughs> the world, and I'm out, you know, the world is... You know, you start being around people with money and power, like, uh, you know, the things, the things they do for entertainment and the problems that have to be solved. And yeah. Hey, so what you think about this whole Epstein thing where they killed him so that, you know, he wouldn't tell. I, I, I wanted to say it was a conspiracy theory, but I mean, shit. The, guy, <laughs> the guy that was like his cellmate who they moved out of a cell but they could have the door could have been left open he was a he was a white cop who was in in jail waiting trial for killing 
four people in a drug deal gone bad and burying them in his own backyard. So oh. it was a big rough guy. And uh, shit, when I remember when the Catholic Church thing first broke and those first priests were going to prison, one of the real bad early ones, he went to prison in Massachusetts. And within like a year, his cell door was accidentally left open. A guy ran in there and strangled him to death. Dang. So I've so, been in jail and like the police, listen, I've been in a jail cell when the police come in and say, hey, they call everyone to the bars. They say, the guy we're about to bring in, he's the one you saw in the news has been driving around with his girlfriend and baby dead in the trunk. And they walk away and they bring him in and, you know, the guy gets seriously assaulted and they drag him out and nothing, you know, they, they right. set you up to do it and they don't do nothing about it. So. I don't know as possible. Certainly in that position, if you were Epstein, might want you might you want to kill yourself? Sure. So he might have, but maybe not. And the thing though that people gotta know, like you might read an article and say, Oh, well, it says this and that mark was found on his neck. So that means he did or didn't kill himself. The information you get from any news source, you know, is all suspect. Right. Because you know, everyone has an agenda. There's money to be made for the people writing the articles. The more crazy the article could be, the more views they get. But then there's also a reason to cover things up. So it's really, in this age of more and more information, it's harder and harder to know the truth. So are you going to get more into like political uh, kind of documentaries and stuff uh, coming up? Like, what do you got planned for uh, 2021? Well, actually, I'm going to go record this one I wrote uh, tonight, um, and it's ties two, two stories together. It's political. It's about it's about social manipulation of social media. Okay. To engage, you know, to control events. So it's two stories. It's one about the Bolivian election in 2019 and another story about a fake news story I saw about that there was a white man randomly going around northern Ohio killing black people and the police weren't doing anything. And I was just like, I'm not, I never hear of this. And then I was looking at where the account and where the story came from and it no longer exists. And I know from, because I get so many comments, because, you know, I have so many followers. Right. I'm looking at people's social media accounts all the time. And, and a lot of the weird comments or racist comments or conspiracy theory comments. I'll do, I'll try to investigate who's posting. And there are these weird accounts that are like, oh, this isn't a real person, or this is like some foreigner's idea of what they think a racist white person or some black person's Instagram account would look like, but it's like right. weird. It doesn't seem real. Right. So there's a lot of weird shit going on. So yeah, so that. And then uh, I got a fictional movie I wrote called Milligram. It's kind of about dark side of the rich lowlifes of Hollywood, loosely based on my own experiences here. So I'm going to be shooting that uh, top of the year. Okay, cool. So, um, you know, 2020, man, was the year of the COVID pandemic and the world shut down. 2021 is going to be too. It ain't ending yet. Right. Like how has it, how has that affected your business? I know you probably travel a lot, be around a lot of different people. Like how has- I haven't been... traveled, I've still been around a million people. I've had a lot of people in and out of town. Well, people are at home watching videos. So actually views are up on everything. You know that. Yeah. Um, now in the last two months, I haven't really made much new because it's like, I feel like, you know, I have people treat me in an important way like hey you know we respect what you're doing it's not just i'm not just gossiping so i need to i just can't keep doing the same thing and i need to think about and take seriously my position and what i'm gonna say and do so that's that's yeah it's made me think about like it's not just about money like i gotta do something serious and now that the youtube is getting filled up with people just gossiping about who killed chief key or i mean who killed king vaughn and i know the real story you yeah know I mean? yeah I, I i hate i hate that stuff man i never, never wanted, wanted to make that about, just making shit up right yeah I, I never wanted to make that type of content man i Good. like it, it, it's i see it on instagram it's cool for instagram but i feel like people trying to make youtube careers out of just talking about gossip i feel they, like they it's, it's right gossip yeah it's it's you know it's it's gonna fall off man i don't think it's gonna last so 
I agree. No, you're very wise for knowing, knowing that. And YouTube is cracking down at it. Like you said, like a lot of stuff isn't monetized. That's why you see all those guys with those super chats because that's the only way they can get me money. But they really don't have anything to say. And I think it's just kind of like after, the, you know, people are able to hang out, go back to hanging out. It's just something to do. Smoke your blood, listen to this idiot talk in a circle about something he doesn't know anything about. Right. right? Someone from Florida is going to tell you what happened, you know, in Inglewood, Chicago. Well, how right. does he look like? You know what I'm saying? He's just talk. He's taking stuff he read from somewhere else that wasn't true in the first place and making it up. So you're right. It's going to it's going to go away. And I'm glad it needs to. Yeah. So, well, one thing I'll tell you is this. Like I said, I've been a, a hip hop fan, a, a you know, a, a gangster doc street fan. Like I've just been a fan of that stuff since I was, you know, a teenager, man. And I and I salute you because everything that you've ever done, it's like you could put that stamp on it. You know what I mean? You don't got to second guess it if it's coming from over here or over there, if it's right or wrong. Like when Al Prophet make a doc about it, that's real. You know what I mean? And, I, and I've been a, around a lot of people who do this, do this same thing. Well, I appreciate that. And that's what I strive for. And that's why, you know, it's kind of taking it slow at the moment. And um, also, I don't know if you know this, you know, Facebook is monetized now too. Yeah, so yeah, I saw that. Make it like I, I spent two months just re-uploading everything from YouTube to Facebook. So they gave me time to kind of take a break and not have to make anything new and get, but yet get some new money. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah. I like that. Well, hey, man, Al Profit, man, I appreciate your time. Uh, you know what I'm saying? Great Let conversation. Me, yeah, maybe we can we can collab. I, 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 yeah. Chicago's very interesting and everything I do in Chicago does well. And uh you know, trying to build up my Chicago contacts. So we'll we'll talk about doing collabing on something. Yeah, no, definitely, man. Definitely appreciate it. Well, hey, thank you for your time, man. Hey, this is Street Certified Podcast, man, special edition with the big homie, man, Al Profit. Thank you, sir. Salute, Street Certified. Appreciate you for having me. Keep doing your thing. See you soon. Thank you, man.